My name is Charlie Holmes. I'm at the BMA Seminary. That stands for Baptist Missionary Association Seminary in Jacksonville, Texas. Been there as administrator and professor in homiletics for the last 20 years. I'd like you to look in your Bible if you have the opportunity to. Leviticus in chapter 10. Leviticus in chapter 10, then also be turning in your Bible and mark the place of Deuteronomy and chapter 12. We'll read these two texts as a set up introduction to just a few words about a foundation, theological foundation in the regulative principle of worship that leads to having also a pattern, a biblical pattern for our exposition. Leviticus in chapter 10, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Oftentimes we get into a situation where we want to do the right thing, but many times we do the right thing the wrong way. In my pocket, I have a Texas driver's license that I've had for a long, long time. That gives me the opportunity to drive on Texas highways and roads. But it doesn't give me the right or opportunity to do the right thing the wrong way. It doesn't give me opportunity or authority to speed way beyond the speed limit. It doesn't give me authority to drive in the wrong lane or drive on the wrong side of the road. So we can do the right things in the wrong way. Here in Leviticus in chapter 10, you have the sons of Aaron, and up until this point, for at least three chapters, they've talked about things that they've done, and the Lord accepted them over and over again. They did as the Lord commanded. And then at the end of that space, you have these two young men, and they decide to do what's been going on before, as far as offering, making offerings to God, but then they decide to do it their own way, in a way that God did not command them to do. Verse 1, again, of chapter 10, they placed incense. They've been told to have incense and make offerings. It says they offered strange fire. Literally, that means they offered fire. They gave worship that was not authorized by God. I want you to think with me for a moment also as I give a short reading from Deuteronomy in chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29. We know that Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. They've had the law given before. They ran afoul of God when they didn't take the law seriously. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and now the people of God are about to make their second attempt at going into the Holy Land. And he's given them the law over again. Verse 29, be careful to listen to all these words which I command you, so that it may be well with you and your sons after you forever, for you will be doing what's good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Then the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations which you're about to go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in the land. Beware that you are not ensnared to follow them after they've been destroyed before you, that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? That I may also do likewise. You shall not behave in this way toward the Lord your God, for every abomination, every abominable act which the Lord hates, they've done for their gods. They've even burned their sons and daughters in the fire. And then the verse everybody always remembers. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to or take away from it. The principle here is they were told how to worship God. And they thought they had the right God in mind. Obviously they did. But this God, the true, the living God, is telling them on their second attempt to serve him, go into the Holy Land, he's telling them, as you worship me, don't even look at what these other pagan deities supposedly require as worship. In other words, don't look at what they do when they say they're worshiping their God and do their same activities or use their attitudes or actions. 
Don't even think about doing what the world does. Don't worship me the way they worship their gods. So you can do the right thing. You can worship God, but you can do it in the wrong way. The Baptist Confession of Faith that I'm about to read from says that in the service of God that we can do perhaps the wrong way when we get up before God's people and to lead them in worship. I'll give you just a short reading about how the scriptures themselves direct the worship of God's people in the context of looking forward to do perhaps the scriptures themselves have a pattern for preaching. And I would propose that there is a pattern for preaching and it is expository preaching. But here is an idea about the, well, how our forefathers took concern about the strength of God's Word and how to use it. Baptist Confession of Faith that was adopted by the First Association of Baptists in the United States in the 1700s, Philadelphia, and also by the Charleston Association not too many decades after that. Here's what they say about the Scriptures. I want you to notice in just in the first phrase, something that's a topic now that's come to the forefront in religious life for a long time. We say that we have fought the, the battle over inerrancy. But now a lot of people are talking about not just inerrancy, but about sufficiency. Do we need to have a new teaching or a new thought about that? Let's see what our four Baptist forefathers said of the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. In the first line, in the first six words, Baptists of long ago, our forefathers, said not only is the Word of God sufficient, it is sufficient. In other words, it contains everything we need, as the Bible would say, for life and godliness. It gives us the elements of worship, but I would propose perhaps in the next section that we look that it gives also a pattern for the way that we present the Word of God. Let me give you just a little more of what it says. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness and wisdom and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet this nature we look at is not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will which is necessary for salvation. Therefore it pleased God at sundry times and divers manners, quoting from the New Testament, to reveal Himself and declare His will unto His church. And then afterward for better preserving and propagating the truth and for a more sure and establishment and growth in the church against the corruption of the flesh, malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same to holy into writing, which makes the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing His will unto His people now being ceased. What he's making the point of, or the statement there at the very end, that all other forms of revelation have now ceased. There's no room for any more so-called inspired scriptures after the last of the apostles died had written the last book, the book of Revelation. There's nothing to be added after that. There is no room for supposed charismatic additional kinds of absurd speech. There's no room for further prophecies. There's no more truth to be obtained than what's already recorded in the Holy Scriptures. And specifically, we're talking here today about the regulative principle and how these Scriptures regulate what I do when I get up in front of God. And then, as an extension, there is regulation on how I present the Word of God. Let me elaborate just a little bit about what Baptists have always believed about this regulative principle of worship and how this canonized scripture, completed scripture, is all that we need, again, for life and godliness. It would tell us that the light of nature shows that there is a God 
who has lordship and sovereignty over all. He's just and he's good, does good to all, and therefore ought to be feared, praised, called upon, served, trusted in with all the heart and with all the might. That sounds like worship to me. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself. And so limited to his own revealed will, the scriptures, that he will not be worshipped according to imagination or devices of men. In other words, it's telling us that we don't need to spend time thinking up new elements or parts of a worship service to make ourselves, again, feel more relevant, to be more appealing to people. We have all that we need. And he cannot be worshipped according to the imaginations of men. He doesn't care about my creativity. He doesn't care about my talent, necessarily, about thinking up new things to do in worship, or how to worship. He doesn't need the devices of men, nor the suggestions of Satan, under any visible representations, or any other way not prescribed by the Scriptures. No visible representations. God is beyond physically representing him in any form. He is a spirit. God is a spirit. We worship him in spirit and in truth. But it goes beyond just not having idolatry. It goes on to say that we are not to worship God in any way that we're not directed to in the scriptures. They are sufficient and they are complete. Again, In just a little while, we might look further into the idea of the principle that these scriptures not only tell us what to do, but they tell us how to do it. Let me mention one other quotation here about the idea of worship and the regulative principle that would also regulate the way we present the Word. It talks about prayer as being a vital part of the public worship of God. But Then it goes on, to go beyond prayer, to talk about other elements. What are we supposed to do when we go to church? What makes up a public worship service, the elements of it? Here are the elements or principal parts. The reading of the scriptures, preaching, and the hearing of God's word. Put that at the very beginning of this paragraph teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with a grace in our hearts to God, and also the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper are all parts of the worship of God to be performed in obedience to Him. There we have the elements of a public worship service. We pray, preferably our, word, our prayers are being for, informed by the Word, but then we pray, then we read the Scriptures publicly, give attention to that, and then we preach the Word, and then we sing the Word, and then we practice the ordinances. We see these ordinances, the Word, in our eyes and not just in our ears. So the idea I want you to see here from these passages we read earlier Where God tells the Israelites, He tells them, don't use your imagination and then don't look at the world or the setting around you to try to make the worship of me more relevant, more appealing, more socially connective with the current culture. Don't do that. So just do what I say and include what I say. Do not add to it nor take away from it. Now to shift from that just a little bit, of doing the right thing in the right way in worship in general, we want to look at, for just a moment, another passage or reading about this preaching of the Word. Again, in that paragraph, it started with the reading of the Scriptures, preaching and hearing the Word of God are the primary things we're looking for in a public worship service. Now, let me expand on that portion just a minute. We're going from the regulative principle of worship to the specific section or element of worship we would call the ordinance of the Word, and specifically preaching. 
Keech's catechism that was used by Spurgeon, many of our founding fathers of Baptist work, asked this question after discussing the redemption that's purchased for us by Christ. They asked this question. What are the outward means whereby Christ communicates or shares with us the benefits of redemption? The outward means public worship, preaching, reading the word. Ordinary means the idea there is not that there's not some other way that the Holy Spirit might call, effectually call the elect unto himself. Maybe just by the reading at home by themselves maybe listening, someone sharing the gospel, the word with them, that might happen. But primarily, the outward means and the ordinary means, everyday means that God uses to give you and me the benefits of redemption, sanctification, adoption, justification, all those things are the benefits that Christ purchased for us. The ordinary means, he says... The ordinary means and outward means whereby Christ gives us the benefits of the redemption that he purchased on the cross or his ordinances. Now, Baptists in the past looked at ordinances a little bit more broadly than we do today. They would say that preaching the word, praying the word, reading the word, that is the administration of the word, the ordinance of the word. It says here, the way he perceives or gives to us redemption that he's purchased for us are his ordinances. Then it lists them. But I want you to notice how it lists them. The first thing that it mentions, of the means, says, especially the word. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, and prayer, all of these become effectual to the elect for salvation. In that list of the ordinances, it mentions first and says, especially the Word of God. Then the next question, relating to this Word of God. How is the Word of God made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word, an effectual means or efficient, successful means of convincing and converting sinners and building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. All those things we mentioned, all the ordinances, point people towards the cross, towards Christ. But our founding Baptist forefathers realized that the main element, the most crucial element, you might say, is the preaching of the Word. They used twice the idea or the wording, especially the preaching of the Word. Now, if I were convinced that God's Word is complete, it's inspired, it's infallible, it's sufficient, it's sufficient enough to give me all the means or elements that I need to properly, biblically conduct biblical worship on the Lord's day with the Lord's people. If I'm convinced of that, ought to be also convinced that I can see not only a direct, perhaps direct instruction, but I need to see, is there or are there examples of how to minister the Word of God and reading it publicly, preaching it and applying it because it is especially powerful, especially anointed by God. I ought to be able to look at the Scriptures and see, is there a methodology, is there a pattern that I can see revealed in these holy scriptures that tells me how I ought to be able to communicate God's word effectively. And in the next session, we'll talk about the fact and hopefully prove to you that there is a pattern for the preaching of the word of God, the ordinance of the word, reading, preaching, and exhortation of God's Word.